So welcome to the webinar on the CICD solution from Serverless Framework. Uh, my name is Gareth McComsky, and I'm going to introduce myself a bit more in a minute. We're just going to do a couple of uh, a bit of housekeeping information here. Uh, we have an FAQ section as a part of the webinar. Um, so the plan is that I'm going to be presenting the, uh, the, the webinar and the demo. And any questions, please feel free to drop that in the Q&A section. We also have Fernando and Marche from Serverless Inc. here to help with the questions in the chat and potentially the Q&A as well. So if you see them answering questions, uh, they know what they're talking about. They work with Serverless. Uh, so, yeah. And to get started then, like I said, my name is Gary McComsky. That's me. Um, I am a, a customer success engineer at Serverless. And I've been working in the web development field for a number of years now, uh, building web applications. And in about 2016, I started building serverless applications myself and joined the team uh, last year uh, working with serverless. All right, so let's take a look. What are we going to actually be talking about today? Um, and obviously, we're going to be looking at uh, the, the serverless framework pro CI/CD. And one of the things we're going to take a brief look at is what the advantage is of serverless framework pro CI/CD solution over and above other CI/CD solutions you may use to deploy your serverless applications. Then we're going to look at what it takes to get connected to Serverless Framework Pro if you choose to use the tools we provide. And then we're going to start looking at the use of the CICD solution uh, as a part of the general software development lifecycle that you may have in your organization, starting with uh, doing integration testing as a, as a developer developing a service and you need to deploy your service into an AWS account so that you can uh, test that service before you, you know, merge that into your code base and potentially goes into production. From that point on, we're going to look at what preview deployments are and how this becomes useful in reviewing uh, pull requests. Then uh, onto the promotion pipelines, which is the real meat of the CRCD solution where you can promote a uh, 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 you can promote code into a development environment and then further from that into production. And then we're going to look at a specific uh, pattern, uh, the monorepo pattern, where you have multiple services stored under a single GitHub repository uh, and how that can be managed through serverless CI CD. And if we have a bit of time, I might go through a bit of how we can use custom scripting uh, methods as a part of the CI CD solution if the existing solution doesn't quite cover all the features you need, there are ways that you can customize it as well. So let's just go through a quick, uh, quick list of advantages, why you would want to consider Serverless Framework Pro for your, for your CI CD as opposed to other tools that may be on the market. And so one of the real big advantages is that the, the Serverless Framework Pro CI CD solution only deploys Serverless Framework applications. We are not trying to deploy uh, all sorts of different environments and frameworks out there, so we don't need to support all those different environments. This means that we have a reduced number of cases we need to support, and this becomes useful uh, because we also include our deployment profiles, which we will take a look at as part of the demo. And these are already available if you're using the Service Framework Pro to deploy your applications into AWS. And combining this together with the uh, uh, reduced uh, uh, case, uh, cases we need to support and the deployment profiles, it makes a fast, simpler configuration process, reducing the complexity in, in building a CICD uh, configuration. It means you don't need somebody with years of experience that understands how to script these things and configure them to the nth degree to get them to work the way that you want. So getting connected to Solus Framework Pro, this is actually a very simple process, and uh, many of you may already be familiar with this. And we will take a brief look at how this looks in code in a second. But it's really as simple as going to dashboard.serverless.com and creating yourself an account. This will then create for you an org and an app that you can then use. And this org and then app is then added to your services serverless.yaml file. You run a serverless login command on the command line in order to authenticate your CLI to your dashboard account. At that point, you can run the deploy command. And if you set up the deployment profile, which again, we'll take a look at in a second, you can then deploy straight into your AWS account without any AWS credentials on your local machine. And it's really as simple as that to get, get connected to Serverless Framework Pro. There's no additional libraries to install. There's no includes required in your code. It's literally a case of adding two lines to your serverless.yaml file, and you are now deploying through Serverless Framework Pro. 
So let's take a look at what this kind of process looks like. If you're a developer developing a service and you need to deploy into AWS, for example, to test your code before merging it or, or, or creating a pull request to merge into your code base. So what you're looking at here uh, is an example of, I have a service here. This is a very simple service. In fact, this is essentially the bootstrap service you get running serverless create command uh, with a very simple handler. And all I've done is add an HTTP event to this uh, handler as well. And as I mentioned before, you add the app and the org setting. So I have an app, an org here that I've created to, uh, to deploy uh, my uh, service through. And my app is called CICD. So I just add those settings to my service.yaml file. I've already run the serverless login command on my CLI, so I'm not gonna do that again. But I could go ahead and just deploy this command on the command line um, after I've created my deployment profile. So here I'm now in Solar Ceramic Pro, and if you haven't seen this before, I'm just looking at the apps I've created. This is the CICD one that I've created to my service.yaml file. And if I go into my org, I want to set my deployment profiles for my org. And deployment profiles is really a way for me to control how I deploy my service into a specific environment. So if I need to deploy into a development environment for all my, uh, for my staging environment, for all my integration testing, I'll create a development profile. I'll create a production profile to deploy into my production environment. But in this case, because I'm, a, I'm, I'm creating a profile for my developers to deploy to, I'm going to just use the default profile that's created. In my default profile, I want to connect this to an AWS account. And this gives me the opportunity to choose an AWS account that I have specifically created for the purpose of uh, having the developers in my team deploy to. So this, has no in, this does not interfere with my staging or development environment that's shared between the entire team, nor my production environment, which obviously I don't want any interaction with uh, unless it's completely authorized. And to connect to my AWS account, I'm gonna click the connect, a, connect AWS button, really as simple as that. Opening up my AWS account, and this is gonna create a stack in CloudFormation that connects my serverless dashboard account to my uh, AWS account for me. And this re really just takes a few seconds for the stack to uh, finish creating and for this connection to be made. So to speak about the, what, what this enables us to do at this point. Now, bearing in mind, I, I'm eventually going to have a development profile and a production profile, but this lets me do things like set up features such as safeguards, which lets me apply policies on top of my uh, deployments to manage uh, what those deployments look like when they go into development or into production. Uh, some examples of this is uh, uh, policies such as no uh, unsafe wildcard permissions. So if I have IAM permissions with a star in them, a wildcard, this policy will prevent deployment from happening uh, or throw a warning depending on how it's configured. Just one example of, of how safeguards uh, can help you in your deployment process. The other very useful side is in parameters. So parameters are useful, as you can see here. For example, I might want to provide access to my Stripe Sandbox account for my developers. But in production, I don't want the Sandbox account. I want the actual live production uh, uh, API key. So in that case, I would use the same key value as a parameter. But I can use the, an alternate value in my production profile. And what this means for me as a developer is that I can now, in my service, use this parameter. And we have provided you detailed information here on how to add that into your service.demo file. Switching to my code, I can go to my environment section here. And I add access to my Stripe API key here. The useful thing about this feature is that when I deploy through the default profile, it's going to put the value that we have in the profile there. If I deploy to my development or my production environment, it's going to replace and put the correct value in place uh, in that case. So that no matter what environment I'm in, I'm using the correct parameter for that, that, for that specific environment. So with this connection set up, I'm now going to switch to my apps. And in CICD, I now am going to deploy my CICD service through the default profile into, uh, into my AWS account. So on the command line, I can just type SLS deploy. And note, I haven't got any, um, any specific um, uh, 
uh, credentials on my local machine to deploy through. This is using my connection to my AWS account to deploy into that AWS account for me. What this has done is it's creating a, a set of temporary credentials for me to deploy into my AWS account. So that once deployment is complete, those credentials time out, and there's no AWS credentials sitting on my machine as a developer, yet I'm still able to use an AWS account for testing purposes. All right, so what I've also got though is with this specific environment, I have a uh, Git repository that I've already created here, and you can see I've already got two branches, master and develop, and this is the same service, but now I want to uh, make some changes and push those into my repository. So this brings us to the next step in, in, in the demo today. So just quickly to go roughly through the integration uh, recap on integration testing. What this allows us to do is set up a profile for all developers to use for personal testing, which allows, lets me push code at a specific AWS account so that it doesn't interfere with my staging or production environments. This, in, this means I can do integration testing on live services. So if I integrate with a DynamoDB or an S3, I'm actually testing in the cloud with these live services. And as far, this, this ends up being far more accurate than any kind of local testing I might do with simulated services. And it also means that I'm reducing the unnecessary changes that get made to shared environments that might interrupt the work of other teams uh, working in my development or staging environments as well. So preview deployments is a, is a feature of serverless CICD that allows me as a developer to now create a pull request for code that I've uh, been working on. And when I create the pull request, I now want somebody to review my, my pull request before it gets merged into the branch. And in, in, a, in the usual sense, these reviews uh, occur by somebody just looking at my code uh, and potentially just going, okay, that code looks okay. But a preview deployment means that when I create the pull request, it immediately creates a, a, a test stack for any reviewer to potentially look at. So when I look, as a reviewer, when I go look at the spec that the, uh, the developer was meant to follow to uh, solve the problem for, I can now see whether that spec was resolved or not and accept the pull request or not. And what that looks like when I set this up, I want to go to my service in CRCD and set up the ability to do uh, 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 preview uh, builds. So within CRCD settings, first of all, I'm gonna connect to GitHub here. Choose my GitHub account and just pick my repositories. And I've picked all repositories here just for simplicity, but obviously this is the generic GitHub flow. You can pick whichever repositories you want for specific purposes. And now with, uh, with the repos uh, listed, I'm gonna pick the specific repos, the CSD repo here, CSD project. And I'm gonna choose I have the settings for preview deploys here, and I'm gonna choose which branch I want preview deploys to be created on. And in my case, this is gonna be my develop branch. Master will be my production branch. And that's all I need to do. I can save settings here, and pull requests will now create preview deploys. So let me go and do just that. I'm just gonna save these settings here. So let me uh, commit these changes. And now I can push it up my repository. Once it's pushed, I'm gonna create my uh, pull request. So I'm gonna create a pull request here. Obviously you're gonna put whatever comment you want. And at this point, I should now see that, uh, that I saved my settings correctly. That is the question. Oh, I created my pull request incorrectly. Uh, I'm going to close the pull request. Let me just stop that again. New pull request. I want to create against the develop branch because that was the settings I chose. My new branch. Create new pull request. And you can see serverless CID is already kicking in here and it's already started a deployment. So if I come back to my deploy section here in my uh, serverless framework account, my new deployment's already begun in behind the scenes and it's already deploying the stack for me into my AWS account. And this deployment's gonna create a brand new stack that I can go and see all the details for. I can see the endpoints for. Uh, as a reviewer, I can go from GitHub here, 
and just click the details button to get loaded into that uh, specific deployment. So I can see all the details of this stack that's been deployed, test it, send the data I need to to the services and the functions and so on before I accept the pull, accept the pull request and merge it into the develop branch. Now this will be a new stack that has been created, so it's going to it takes a little bit of extra time to deploy. Um, and, and you can immediately see we've got a number of steps in the deployment process. So some of you may see this for the first time. The, the deployment process goes through various steps, including uh, running tests. So one of the things that we have included is if you, you do have tests defined in your package.json file, for example, which this doesn't have, so it's not running the tests yet. If you have a package.json file that was, in a, that was created from NPM, it will automatically run your uh, NPM tests. The same is true for Python as well. And if the tests return an error, the deployment immediately seizes and, and shows as a failed build. And that will also appear in GitHub itself. If your tests pass, however, then the, the, the deployment process completes uh, fully and, and so on. What you can also see during the deployment process was that it was going through those safeguards that were configured uh, previously that we looked at. Here you can see I don't have any safeguards that, uh, uh, that errored out the deployment. So the deployment is continuing without, uh, without error. If the, any of those safeguards uh, were breached, the deployment would immediately cease and a failed build would happen, which is a great way to stop any merges from happening into uh, branches later that you don't want to have to, uh, to go into production necessarily. And there we go. The deployment is just finished. So now as a, uh, as a reviewer on the team, I can also come through to my uh, um, services here and I see the branch name was used as the stage name. And coming through, I can see I've got an endpoint that I can go test. We can just grab this endpoint and run it. Review, I can see, oh, there's an internal server error. I'm going to go back to the developer and tell him to go fix his errors or take a look in in, in the app myself to see what the errors might be and report back to them and decline the pull request. So that is the, uh, I'm not going to merge the pull request quite yet, but that is the preview uh, builds for uh, serverless CI CD. So preview deployments, just to recap again quickly, this is a great way for somebody uh, to review a pull request by instead of just reviewing the, instead of just reviewing the code, you can actually look at a working service. It's great for reviewing that spec uh, afterwards so that you can confirm that if all the features have been developed that need to be. The automated deployment of the, uh, of the preview deployment uh, happens automatically. And once the branch is merged and the, uh, and, and once the pull request is merged and the branch deleted, this uh, stack is automatically deleted for you so that it clears up any of those, uh, any of those stacks. So now we've gone through the, the sort of software development life cycle here of a developer by themselves trying to test uh, deployments and you can use Serverless Framework Pro to help, it, help a developer on your team deploy into the right AWS account for their own uh, testing purposes. We then have the preview deployments that let a developer create a pull request that automatically creates a stack so that a, a reviewer can come and make sure that whatever they've created meets the spec and it can be accepted. But now we want to accept this pull request and merge it into our uh, code base. And what would be great is if we could have a way to automatically deploy mergers of pull requests into branches. So to do that, we're going to go back to our CRCD settings. And we've set up the preview deploys. Now we want to look at setting up branch deploys. But one of the steps that I want to do is I want to have a specific environment setup uh, that I'm going to deploy to because this is now my shared environment. This is the environment where I'm going to be doing integration testing, end-to-end -end testing, and so on. So I need to link somehow a specific AWS account uh, for my development environment to the specific branch. So we're going to pop back to take a look at the deployment profiles and just create a new deployment profile for my development environment. So let's just create that new development profile. I'm going to call it develop. And then I'm going to link this developer profile to, uh, to an AWS account. In my case, it's going to be the same one, uh, but many organizations prefer to use multiple AWS accounts for the different environments to, again, segregate the different stacks to make sure there's nothing, nothing gets overwritten. I'm just going to quickly create a connection here and create the stack. 
And again, this takes a few seconds and then the stack gets created. And once again, just to, just to refresh it, this gives me the opportunity to set parameters again. So I'm actually going to go ahead and set that Stripe API key here that I had before. So let me just copy that out. And now I can put probably the same sandbox account here. And I now have the param set up here as well. So my parameter is now specifically created for this uh, development environment itself. My AWS account is connected. So now I'm ready to use this development profile. If I go back to my application, I now need to connect that development profile to the right, uh, to the right branch. So in my app settings, I want to use a stage. And it, we mentioned stages. When you make a deployment on your command line, you can use a stage parameter to specify the stage you want to deploy to. And in the same way, uh, serverless uh, CI CD uses these stages as a way to connect the deployment profile to the branch that you want to deploy to. So we're just going to configure the stage we're going to be using for that purpose right now. So let's go ahead and create ourselves a stage. And we're going to connect that to our develop deployment profile. And finally, in the CICD settings, I may now need to point my branch to that specific uh, configuration. So I am going to have pull requests will be merged into the develop branch. And you can see it's really picked the stage that I just created because that's the only available stage left. So the develops uh, branch will deploy to the develop through the uh, develop stage, which is linked to the develop deployment profile. And that's it. That's all I need in order to do those promotion pipelines. And if I go back to GitHub here, I can merge my pull request, confirm the merge. And once this is merged, we should see a deployment kickoff in, and there it goes. So now, because I've merged that pull request, I automatically have a deployment updating my staging environment to make sure that whenever my integration tests are running, it's always running with the most up-to-date uh, development version of code that has been accepted uh, by a pull request by my team. So there we go. We have a promotion pipeline up and running. But there are some additional configuration options I can choose here. So let's just take a look at those quickly. And we have an advanced settings section over here. So I do have some options to choose, for example, alternate regions. If I don't want to use US East 1, I could potentially pick another region. Um, and I can also choose, uh, have some settings for my preview deploys here. I can choose to not have these stages get destroyed when the branch is deleted. And I can also choose to use a specific uh, stage instead of the, uh, using the branch name as a, as a stage. We'll be looking at the trigger directory settings in a few minutes. All right, so this deployment is going to continue. What I'm going to do now, though, is based on our software development lifecycle that we've been going through, I have a developer who's been developing. Uh, he's now uh, he's used deployments to test. He's created a pull request that's created a preview deployment. The PR has been accepted and merged, which has kicked off this automated deployment to the development environment. Now I want now now I've tested my development environment, and I want to essentially promote my develop branch into master to put it all into production. So again, this is pretty much the same setup that we did previously. I'm going to go back to my application and set up my CI CD settings. Oh, I just need to set up my, uh, forgive me, I need to set up my deployment profile for production. So again, with the deployment profile, I am now specifying the exact environment that I want my production code to uh, be deployed to. So create a production profile. And again, I might, uh, if I was an organization with a team of developers, I might, pick a, uh, I might pick a separate AWS account. In my case, I'm going to pick the same one. And once again, it's going to create this uh, role for me via a stack. I'm just going to acknowledge that and create the stack. And we'll give it a few, few seconds to finish doing that. And while I'm here, again, I'm going to just make sure I've got my, all my parameters set up. So I'm going to copy Stripe API key. And in this case, this is, this is going to be my production key now. Oops. All right. 
then this gives me the opportunity now to set up my safeguards for production. They probably make this far stricter for production than I would in any uh, development or staging environment. My AWS account is connected, so my profile is now ready to be used. If I go to my app, I'm gonna create that stage again. So if I go to my stages, I'm gonna create a production stage and point that at my production profile. Here we go. And now with my CICD settings, I'm just gonna point my master branch at my production profile. So master branch points at my production stage and that's it. Now I am fully set up to merge my develop branch into the master branch. My deployment has finished. I can see just by the little dot there. So what I'm gonna do is in GitHub again, I'm going to go to my uh, code. Let's create ourselves a new pull request. Oh, there it was, doesn't matter. You can merge, develop into master, create a pull request. In this case, I won't have a preview deployment because I haven't configured that. It's only configured for mergers into, uh, for pull requests that merge into, into develop. I'm merging into master. So this is not gonna create a preview deployment. And I'm gonna merge my pull request. And now I've, I'm busy taking my code into production. And I should have a, a deployment starting, and there it goes. And now I have my production deployment starting. So let's just recap quickly about the promotion pipelines feature. The promotion pipelines is an automated way to help you keep your branches up to date with what's in your uh, GitHub repository. It removes that potential for human error that you often find in deployments, especially when you have to manage them manually. And it helps pre prevent production from falling behind your current master branch. You, you, know, you don't want to end up in that scary situation where you're weeks behind on, in production what you have in your master branch because deployments get far more complicated the longer you wait to deploy them. Uh, the promotion to environment, uh, you can promote to the correct environment just by using a git merge into the right branch. So this is all based on your branching strategy inside GitHub, which gives you real, a real amount of flexibility to have as many different stages or environments that you wish to have in your uh, promotion to production. Now, one of the more common patterns that we see at Serverless is uh, you, customers tend to, uh, users like to use a monorepo approach where they have multiple services uh, all stored within the same GitHub repository. Um, and this is for various reasons, uh, but it does present a challenge when you're looking at a CI CD solution. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to switch to a different project that I have here. This is one I've specifically set up to show a monorepo environment. And you can see, it might be even clearer to see in, in GitHub. You can see here I've got my monorepo test uh, GitHub repo, and it has multiple services within it. Here's service A, and each one has its own serverless.yaml file. Service B has its own serverless.yaml file. And you can see the root of this repo does not have a serverless.yaml. So the root itself is not a serverless service, but it does contain four serverless services, as well as one shared uh, folder as well. And this will contain whatever library your team may have developed that gets shared between all of these uh, different services. So the challenge here becomes, how do you manage any dependency between these? What if you have a dependency between these services and the shared folder? How do you manage the right deployment based on the right uh, mergers into the right branches and so on? This can get a little bit complicated to do, but uh, with Serverless Framework Pro, we provided a, ways for you to configure this in a relatively simple way that helps make sure that code that is dependent always gets pushed into production in the correct way without pushing everything to production all the time. But to start off with, let's look at some configuration for this. So I'm just gonna go to my apps here and you can see I've got a monorepo app here already set up. And my multiple services are already deployed in some fashion to AWS. But I wanna set up uh, I want to set up the CI CD uh, for this so that I can deploy each service through, uh, through GitHub. So service A, let's start with service A. I'm going to enable CI CD here. I'm going to pick the correct repository for this, which is monorepo test. And here already, what we're doing is we're already scanning through these, the, the folder structure of the, of the, of monorepo test to determine which uh, folders might contain services. And we notice that the base directory, the root directory, doesn't contain a, serverless, a valid serverless.yaml file. But when looking through these subfolders, we do see serverless.yaml files. You can see I've got service A, B, C, and D. I don't have the shared folder because that didn't have a valid serverless.yaml file. 
So immediately we've limited it, limited the options here to what is a valid serverless service. I'm configuring service A, so I'm gonna pick service A. I'm gonna keep preview deploys off in this case, just for simplicity while we go through the demo. And now I wanna set up some branch deploys. So first of all, I'm gonna to need to set up that stage. So let's quickly go set up a stage. I'm gonna add a new stage. I'm gonna call this the develop stage for this app. I'm gonna use my uh, developer profile. And this is where I can just point out one other thing is that the, de the, the deployment profiles are an organization-wide uh, setting. So if you create a deployment profile through org, it's available in all of your apps. If you do need to have a way to uh, keep these deployment profiles separate, you can create additional orgs in, uh, in your uh, account just by clicking here and it'll keep a completely separate list of deployment profiles if you wish. This is what, we're happy with this, so I'm gonna create that stage. I'm just gonna go back to my CICD settings. Pick mono repo test again. Pick service A, skipping preview deploys. Now I can pick my develop branch to point to that develop stage I just created. And that's it as well. I can immediately use this uh, as a way to deploy my mono repo. So what that looks like, if I go ahead and make a change to my service A, let's just make some innocuous change here. I'm gonna change this to some value 10. And let's just push this change to, into GitHub. I have a deployment that is kicked off. Great, there's my service A that is now deploying. However, if I had gone ahead and made another change, let's say I go to service B and make a change here. Hello world, let's put a few more of those exclamation marks, they're always nice. Let's push this commit to the same branch. Service B has had a change. I haven't configured Service B for CICD yet. Service B should not uh, be uh, deploying. I haven't set up CICD. But what I'm going to see in my, in my uh, deployments here is that Service A is deploying once again. So by default, with the baseline configuration that I've set up for this mono repo, every service will deploy when any change is made anywhere in the entire repository. And this is just a, this is just a safe way to do deployments if you haven't configured anything deeper, which we're gonna look at in a second. The reason for this is that I may have dependencies between these services and there's no way for Solus Framework Pro to know what those dependencies are unless they're configured. So by default, we're gonna redeploy every service that is configured when there's a change in the repo. But let's go take a look at some of these settings that we can do. So I'm gonna to go to look at service B and let's enable, uh, oh wait, let me go back to service A and just configure some of those uh, CICD settings there. So I want service A, let's just throw a hypothetical out. I want service A to only deploy when, when uh, service A is edited. So if I open up the advanced settings, I've got a trigger directories uh, section here. You can see it's automatically set to always trigger a deployment and that's what's causing our deployment to happen no matter where a change is made. Let's turn that off and I can now specify specific folders that will trigger a deployment. And by default, this will have only service A as a, as a trigger for deployment. And that's really all I want in this case. So I'm gonna click save settings there. And if I do another change, maybe those exclamation marks are a bad idea. Let's push another commit. Let's push that at GitHub. I'm gonna wait for this to finish pushing. And remember, this is service B. Service B has not been set up for CRCD. Service A does not want to redeploy, except if service A changes. If I take a look at my deployments, service A should not have another deployment queued, which it doesn't. So there we go, now service A will not create a deployment unless service A itself is edited. But that might not be the case for the others. Maybe the others all depend on that shared folder that I had in my repository, and I want them all to, uh, all, all of them to redeploy if my shared uh, folder has been edited. So let's go ahead and take a look at service B, and let's just set each of these services up to redeploy based on that specific shared folder. So again, pick my repository, Service B is the one I'm configuring. Preview deploys off. Develop to develop and advanced settings. And now I can turn this off and just say shared. And in that case, now service B will be redeployed if service B changes. 
or their shared folder changes. Save my settings. And now for service B, if I make a change to, to the handler here for service B, that should uh, cause a deployment. But if I make a change to this shared folder here as well, let's make some innocuous change. I'm not gonna try type innocuous, I'm not that brave. Let's make a commit here and deploy this. And now service B should, uh, should create a deployment, but not service A. Once it gets pushed through to GitHub, There we go. Service B is now being redeployed because a dependent uh, folder had changes to it. So you can see we have pretty, pretty nice flexibility when it comes to setting up the dependency between monorepos. For service C, let's just say, for example, service C has a dependency on B and D. So I'm going to pick uh, the monorepo uh, 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 repo again. I'm going to pick service C because that's the one I'm configuring. Preview deploys off. I could leave preview deploys on for any of these uh, as I wish. I'm just turning it off for simplicity uh, while we're doing this. Uh, develop to develop, advanced settings, and now I'm going to say service C will be deployed if service D or whoop, yep, service B is edited and save settings. So now I have I have some dependency management here. If service C, D, or B are edited, service C will be redeployed in that case. So that is essentially how we can manage monorepo deployment with serverless framework, Pro, serverless framework Pro's deployment. Um, a great way to manage those uh, dependencies with, with, with shared libraries and dependencies between services. Um, yeah, and it's all based on your promotion, uh, your, your GitHub repo settings and how you want to promote into production. So just a quick recap on what uh, on the monorepo uh, features we looked at. Monorepo is designed to keep all services for a specific app in the one repo, and there's various reasons to do this. Um, it's not necessarily a required pattern, but various, uh, various uh, users do find this a useful pattern. And this allows, and you can then maintain deployments of services based on the dependency using that shared folders uh, directory. A shared folder, for example, can then also be triggered, to, uh, can trigger redeployments as necessary. And one thing to mention is that all of the features you've seen here are free to get started. There's no, uh, the, the free tier of Solus Framework Pro does include CICD as well as one concurrent build um, at a time. Uh, and if you do need uh, additional concurrency, that is available as well as part of the package. One of the things I'm gonna look at now because we have some time just to go through the options that you have available if you want to do some kind of custom scripting. Because as you've noticed, you've done very little actual configuration of your uh, CRCD process here. You've just selected some options and the deployment process has been essentially managed transparently for you. But you do have some options if you want to customize things to some degree. So looking at the, uh, at the dashboard, at the, at the documentation, we have an, a really good set of documentation on the serverless.com website. If you go through the docs, you'll find the dashboard reference, CRCD, and there's a whole bunch of CRCD information here. I'm just taking a look at one section uh, for custom scripts. And really there are multiple options because if you use something like NPM, for example, NPM, uh, has features that let you do a pre-install, so if, uh, before an NPM install is run. We, uh, as part of the deployment process, we run an NPM install. So you can do a pre-install script to run a specific script before NPM installs, a post-install, or any of these hooks that are available to you, such as the pre-test and so on. All of these are available if you want to run additional scripting before, after, or whenever. In addition to that, it's not just NPM because you can use uh, a serverless plugin called serverless plugin scripts that allows you to write your own uh, hooks into the serverless framework deployment process itself so that during that process you're using a, a you're running a specific script before deploy, before deploy finalize or any of the uh, many lifecycle hooks available as part of the deployment process. The documentation here can walk you through exactly uh, what those uh, hooks are and how to build your own custom uh, scripts as well for uh, deployment. So thank you very much, folks. I'm actually going to move over to looking at the questions that have been posted. 
So if anybody does have questions, now's a great time to drop them in. All right, so <clears throat> it's going to go through the questions. The first question is, is Serverless Framework Pro a SaaS solution? Is it possible to deploy it within our own AWS account? So the Serverless Framework Pro is a SaaS solution. Um, right now, it's hosted within, the, uh, within Serverless's own AWS account. Uh, but if your organization does have needs to host uh, Serverless Framework Pro in your own uh, AWS environment, we can work with organizations that have that requirement. Please just contact the sales team. We do have a sales form. Uh, on, on the service.com site that you can uh, let us know uh, what you're looking for and someone can get in touch to help talk you through that. All right, the next question is, can the serverless pro environment be deployed into my, okay, that's the same question. So Jim Fenner, that's the same question again. So hopefully you, you heard my answer and you can go ahead and just request help from someone. So Chris Lambert asks, uh, I recall limitations on the number of resources per cloud stack. Uh, it's 200 uh, as well, and hitting the ceiling very quickly. Do you automate the process of splitting into different cloud formation stacks or have a means of avoiding this limitation? So that's a, that's a, that's a relatively complicated question, uh, but the short answer is, is that if you, do, uh, if you do a serverless deploy yourself on your local environment and it deploys successfully into, the, into AWS, uh, while connected to Solus Framework Pro. So if you have an app in an org setting, you run SLS deploy on your own machine and it, and it creates this the, and deploys into AWS, then the serverless CI CD will also successfully deploy. If you're looking for techniques on breaking up a stack based on the number of resources used, uh, you do mention the idea of uh, splitting stacks. There are serverless plugins. So if you go to serverless.com slash plugins, you can search there for uh, plugins that allow you to split stacks. And in general, those are great short-term solutions to the large stack problem. Uh, we've actually found most users who end up in that situation are usually better served by trying to break up the service themselves uh, into smaller uh, services, trying to uh, make that domain a little bit smaller. Uh, because even with the split stack um, plugins that you can use, you inevitably still end up having some issues with uh, stack sizes and so on. So if you can, rather break them up manually yourself and use those split stack plugins as a way just to bridge the gap until you can break those services up yourself. Unfortunately, there's very little we can do about the CloudFormation stack limitation that is built into CloudFormation by AWS. And I see multiple tweets a week, people asking AWS if they can reconsider changing that limitation, but that's something we have to wait for at this point. Louis Karabajal, I'm hoping I'm saying that name right. We connect to our AWS accounts through third-party services with SAML. Does Serverless Framework Pro support that scenario? Uh, I haven't actually connected through SAML, uh, so maybe get in contact with us and we can work with our team to see how that would fit your specific situation. I just can't answer that off the top of my head. Uh, ultimately, though, I think our solution, the, the connection from your serverless account to AWS is done via a, a role, uh, a cross-account role that is created that allows us to essentially have access to features in your AWS account to make those deployments happen. Uh, so I don't think that that requires, that, that that is limited by SAML. The great thing is that because Serverless from a Pro is free, you can just go ahead and test this yourself and just try it out. And if you do hit any snags, we do have an intercom link there that you can click to get help on solving any problems you're coming across. And that's in general for anybody listening. Uh, Gene at uh, Ethelsec, again, I'm hoping I'm saying that right, uh, asks, are these features available for non-AWS applications? So at the moment, it is focused primarily on AWS, and the simple reason is that that's where the vast majority of serverless uh, workloads do end up being deployed to. So that's one of the reasons why we uh, currently have focused on AWS. And also because this ends up being a very large uh, task to do to support the different cloud providers with a platform like this. Service from a pro doesn't, doesn't just do CI CD, it also does um, uh, monitoring capabilities uh, as well uh, for your, for your uh, applications in AWS. And that becomes a very sort of vendor dependent type of uh, setup. Uh, Sergey Kovalev asks, function environment variables have four kilobyte limits. Do you have any way to define environment variables in case if you reach the limit? 
So with the params feature that I was mentioning, the params feature doesn't have to only resolve into environment variables in your serverless.yaml file. Uh, you can use the params in the resources section, for example, if you want to have a central configuration there. Uh, you can specify uh, those values pretty much anywhere in the serverless.yaml file. Ultimately, what happens at deployment time is if you, anywhere that you have the dollar param uh, uh, syntax, that gets replaced at deployment time by the value in the, in the parameters section for that deployment profile. So the actual value there is replaced and then the deployment, deployment process concludes with the actual values from the parameter section included. So you can use that anywhere that seems appropriate to you. It doesn't have to be environment variables. Ultimately, if you have that many environment variables, you may also want to consider using an option such as SSM from AWS so that you can pull those values out of SSM or even, honestly, look at using a DynamoDB table for these, uh, for, for these kinds of values. DynamoDB ends up being very quick and is a great way to do key value stores um, and is probably more cost effective than SSM anyway, unless you need the encryption. So Misha Spiegelbach asks, how do you combine this with front-end CRCD like for a React SPA? So as I mentioned at the end, we do have the ability for you to execute additional commands as a script um, when you, um, during the deployment phase. And that's the exact moment that you can then run that specific command that you might need to, to deploy a front end, uh, such as uh, with the uh, various plugins that you can use for front end deployment. Um, yeah, you can just run, you run the serverless, uh, the, the specific CLI command that deploys that front end for that plugin. Um, and that's really where those, uh, those additional scripts become very, very useful to do exactly that kind of thing. So we have an anonymous attendee asking, do we have support for Bitbucket? So the short answer is not yet, but very soon. We're actually right now uh, busy developing the integration into Bitbucket. Uh, we're expecting that to still probably be a, few, a couple of weeks away or more, uh, but not much more than that. It's, it's actively busy being worked on right now. Uh, Amarnath, um, I'm not gonna put your name. Um, I have more respect for you than that. Uh, does this preview feature only possible with GitHub? What's the support for Bitbucket server like? So as I mentioned, Bitbucket support is on the way. We will also be potentially looking at other integrations into other uh, Git uh, providers as well. But Bitbucket is actively being developed right now. Sander asks exactly the same question, Bitbucket support is on the way. For CRCD, can we connect to Bitbucket or code commit repos? Again, Bitbucket is on the way. Code commit, I think, is something that is on our roadmap. There's no ETA on, ETA on that, but that is possibly coming in the future. Chris Shenton asks, SLS dashboard requires CloudWatch log subscription, which sends logs to the dashboard, but I need my own subscriptions to send my, my own elastic search. Is there a way to avoid this conflict? And that's a tricky question to answer. Uh, the reason why the CloudWatch subscriptions is used is because that is the that is probably the least the lowest impact uh, way for us to help get metrics of your uh, of your solution to uh, serverless dashboard for monitoring purposes. Pretty much any other solution that is looked at at some form of latency or unintended side effect that is really not appealing uh, when you need to get monitoring uh, capabilities added to your Lambda functions. And the CloudWatch log subscription is great for us to leverage off of that to help pull those metrics in without um, adding those latency, latency to your uh, application. Um, I believe though you can set up that uh, your CloudWatch logs are automatically pulled into S3 buckets through CloudWatch. I don't think that is dependent on a CloudWatch subscription. I might be wrong on that. Um, and that way you can then point Elasticsearch at the S3 buckets to rather pull those subscriptions in. An alternative that you can also use is to look at using a Lambda function to help you pull those CloudWatch uh, logs out. So you can actually run a, um, a Lambda function that can then push a CloudWatch logs at an S3 bucket and then ultimately add Elasticsearch as well. So there are various ways that we can solve that problem. And you would probably rather have the uh, push to Elasticsearch uh, be delayed uh, than the monitoring built into your Lambda functions uh, cause a delay. So uh, another attendee asks, AWS code deploy with code pipeline does this exactly, exactly for us with some minor changes related to parameters. Can you compare and contrast this feature? Does this work with Azure, for example? Uh, so currently the uh, CRCD pipeline, funnily enough, it might actually work with Azure. We don't directly support it yet, um, 
because essentially what we're doing is we run an npm install on your service and then we run a serverless deploy and if you're using the azure plugin this may actually still deploy into azure you won't be getting any of the monitoring features that are built in for obvious reasons uh, because right now we support aws with that um, but that's not something i've tested so take that with a grain of salt uh, but the real difference between using code deploy and code pipeline is, is pretty much that, that you don't have to work with two diff different systems to try and uh, do deployments. Uh, and code deploy, again, is one of those uh, services that was created for generic uh, deployment purposes to support any framework with any, uh, any language, any uh, system, and so on. So the serverless framework, uh, uh, Service Framework Pro deployment system is meant for Service Framework projects, and uh, and that limited use case means that our configuration is just much simpler to handle with far less complexity. So Misha Spiegelmark asks, any way to run a suite of tests against the deployed preview stack uh, automatically? And yes, you can because the uh, because of the serverless plugin scripts plugin that you can use, for example, to run scripts at the end of the deployment process. You can then, once the deployment process has fully completed and everything is live in your staging environment, you can then run a script that, that kicks off your, uh, your uh, automated um, a suite of tests. And obviously, uh, this is difficult. At this point, uh, the deployment is already finished, and it has to finish in order for these uh, tests to run against your deployed system. So there's no way for us to backtrack and then uh, cancel the deployment. Uh, but you can, for example, go take a look at the result of those tests uh, when you merge into, for example, your development environment and then uh, decide not to uh, promote that into, into production if those tests fail. So that's one way to do that. Uh, have a multi-stage process. For example, you might have a staging branch, a develop branch, and a production branch. And the staging branch runs the tests, develop branch does integration, and then master goes into production, or whichever process you, you choose. So Sergey asks, what is the VM instance types do you use for CI? Is there any way to set pre slash post install, et cetera, commands like you can do it in Travis? So yes, as you saw uh, with the NPM install settings, you can actually set up commands before and after. The VM instance type, uh, I actually don't know what that is offhand. That, that, changes, uh, that has changed a few times as we optimize the uh, deployment uh, engine. Uh, we actually do leverage off of Fargate for some of the deployment processes as well. Um, so. Uh, I don't I don't know the specific VM instance type size and to sp say specific size now would be uh, might be inaccurate in a week or two's time when we optimize it further to make it faster or more efficient in some way um, so I can't answer that directly uh, but yes you can set pre and post install commands uh, to happen as you saw uh, in the documentation so FJ asks, is there a way to use the same built artifact from dev into prod environments? So the short answer is not quite, not by, not out of the box by default. Uh, this depends on the uh, SLS deploy process happening uh, independently for each uh, branch. Uh, but you can set up, if you really want to, you can set up uh, scripts that allow you to, uh, that will uh, post deployment or post uh, packaging uh, push the uh, specific artifact into an S3 bucket, for example, and then on the production environment, you can have a way to uh, pull that, that artifact out instead and continue in some way that way. Uh, so you could go ahead and customize the deployment uh, that way using the scripting capabilities that I mentioned. But by default, for simple configuration, uh, the, the artifact isn't retained between the different environments. And there's various reasons for this, because potentially the artifacts will be different, because you may have different parameters, settings, different environment variables, um, and so on. So another question is about support for uh, anything about uh, something other than AWS. As I said, right now we do support AWS. Uh, we may support other vendors in the future, but right now our support is, uh, is for AWS. So Jennifer Jackson asks, we have a very heterogeneous development environment where we have containers running EKS, Lambdas, and legacy services in EC2. Teams currently use Jenkins, uh, Jenkins pipeline files committed to GitHub with their applications, and GHE webhooks to trigger builds. We utilize multi-branch pipelines. Many of the serverless CI/CD features look attractive for our Lambdas, but we have to think about integration with our other systems. I'm wondering about APIs, et cetera, which might allow us to integrate, i.e. trigger a deployment slash promotion based on the result of the Jenkins job, which does some set of tests, including uh, Kubernetes services, et cetera. So uh, not for your specific, uh, 
not for your specific uh, use case, but there may be ways to do things like uh, use Jenkins to uh, merge branches in GitHub. So you may have a situation where you have uh, an integration waiting in a specific branch in GitHub for your serverless services. Uh, Jenkins is integrating some other feature. Once it completes, it will then merge one branch into another, which then kicks off a CICD process potentially in Serverless Framework Pro. Uh, that's one thing that off the top of my head that comes to mind that you might uh, be able to do via Jenkins uh, and potentially just via the GitHub API. Again, the, the, the scripts, the, the, the as you customize the different hooks in the deployment process might help you out in this situation as well. Um, but really the idea, the entire idea here is to help you manage the deployment of your serverless framework uh, services in a clean and predictable way into your AWS account, uh, pretty much independently of the other services that you may have as well. Um, so yeah, the way I would suggest looking at synchronizing that is between Jenkins talking to GitHub and potentially promoting uh, or, or merging branches into one another to kick off uh, a build that way. So Matt Teleski asks, how does preview deploys handle large stacks? For example, stacks with RDS instances, VPCs, et cetera, could take up to an hour to spin up from scratch. Um, so in a lot of cases, uh, well, the preview deploys actually, this executes, I think our timeout on the deployments is in the order of something like two hours, but I might be wrong on that. Um, what I can recommend is trying out your use case with serverless CI CD. And if you do find that there is a issue there with some kind of timeout, uh, we've actually tested this because of CloudFront uh, delays. Uh, so we've had to extend the sort of timeout parameter of deployments because of CloudFront has those um, long delays of, of for creating distributions. Um, so you should find that the, 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 the timer settings will, will manage uh, perfectly fine. Um, it is, uh, and, and thankfully with uh, the recent changes to VPCs, that has actually become a lot quicker now because of changes to AWS have made. But yes, the time should be long enough. Uh, does serverless allow me to do, do partial deployments? Um, sorry, Axel Ellie, I'm not entirely sure what you might mean by partial deployments. Uh, feel free to drop onto our serverless uh, uh, Slack to ask your question there and we can maybe elaborate more on that or use Intercom in Serverless Framework Pro to drop a question to me there as well. So Jose Raffaelli asks, can you create security rules for users to limit, to limit stages? The short answer is currently uh, not yet, uh, but the team is actually busy working on a far more uh, fine-grained access control feature to allow you to limit specific users to specific stages and therefore environments so that you can make production completely hands off and no one can deploy into production, for example, except by merging a branch into master or whatever strategy you choose. So that is a feature that is uh, being planned and worked on uh, right now. So Kylo Jorgensen asks, does this work for Yarn or other package managers other than NPM? Yeah. By default, no, but you can actually do a, a npm install yarn or npm install dash g yarn uh, as a part of the scripts uh, and have yarn installed uh, and then have yarn execute a yarn install to get all your dependencies up and then just let the deployment process continue from there. We've had a few users already uh, doing it that way. If your repo isn't a monorepo setup, it still has dependencies like you showed, is there a way to trigger deploys for other deployments? At this point, no, the, the best way to actually do that is to try to, is to consider merging those multiple repos into one another uh, for that so that you can manage that sort of dependency a, a, a bit better. Um, otherwise, the other way to do that is, again, through the scripts. You might find a way to handle that through the script section where you can kick off a build for a specific branch uh, in that way uh, via the scripts. How does Service Pro compare with a service like Seed? Uh, unfortunately, I haven't taken a huge look at what uh, Seed offers uh, as far as what, what feature set they provide. Uh, some of the things that I can quickly say Serverless Pro uh, does uh, really well and that we'd be quite proud of is the low uh, barrier to entry integrating, monitoring, CRCD, deployment management, and so on into your service just by adding two lines into a serverless.yaml file. There's no libraries to include into a Lambda function or anything like that. Makes that process really uh, uh, seamless. Um, and that all the automation is automatically added. This wasn't a, uh, a webinar on the monitoring side of Solus Framework Pro, but you get all the features of monitoring uh, um, 
error tracing, CloudWatch log inspection, uh, no notifications, and so on included just as part of the package when you use Solidus Framework Pro. Even if all you want is the CI CD, you get all of it anyway. Hello, I have two questions, says Mauricio Francisco Lopez. About deploy previews, how does it work for applications that communicate to each other? Suppose the serverless stack requires other ap applications to be deployed before to work. So this really depends, depends on how you have your, uh, how you have things structured. Um, the, the preview deployments, uh, one of the settings that you have in the advanced section is that you can, by default, preview deployments will deploy uh, a new, to a new stage based on the branch name. However, you can change that. You can specify the exact stage you want preview deployments to go to, and in that way, you can have a sort of uh, highly, highly changeable staging environment that all developers use to test their services uh, so that you have all that stuff set up uh, for it to connect with. Uh, on the understanding that things might break and change a lot as developers uh, use preview deployments. Uh, but the other way to do this is just to build your application in a way that allows it to not have these hard dependencies on other services. And that might be, that might sound like it's easier said than done, but there are some great techniques to have asynchronous communication between services so that those communications don't break, break, uh, break a specific service if the other, other services are not up and running. Uh, if you want some more information, feel free to ask the question in our uh, community Slack that I see Fernando posted the link to earlier. Uh, and then we can chat more about what that kind of pattern looks like and how that might help you. And he also asked, how do you deal with Docker images to spin up, for example, a database which is required for the tests? So really what this means is if you, all it means is if you can run uh, the test itself. So in NPM, you have the, in your package.json, you can specify the command to run tests. And if that command runs on your local machine without having extra uh, items installed, it'll run in some of this framework pro uh, the CRCD solution. Um, and again, there are ways you can run unit tests without needing Docker. Um, and we do have a blog post available for that, which um, uh, if you take a look through our blog post and search for local testing, uh, there's a blog post about how you can set something up like that so that you can run unit tests without needing something like Docker to have an actual database uh, for your tests. Um, <clears throat> but really, if you can run your, your unit tests locally, then you should be able to run it with Service Framework Pro. And lastly, Carla asks, how does it handle services that need to be deployed before others? So as I mentioned, the uh, monorepo environment is where you can manage that dependency. Uh, right now, uh, the order of deployment isn't managed with Service Framework Pro. That is a feature that we have in our roadmap. Uh, unfortunately, there's no ETA yet on that. Um, but that is something that we will ultimately uh, end up uh, working on as well. Uh, like I said, though, uh, for the previous question, one way to help handle that is to try and avoid having the hard dependencies anyway, so that it doesn't matter what the order is that you deploy in. Um, so sometimes that's easier said than done, but there are potentially ways to handle that as well. All right, so that is the last of the questions. Um, if anybody does, does have any feedback or any questions that they want to share, if you're in Solus Framework Pro, you can use Entercom to ask questions, or ideally come to our community Slack at solus.com slash Slack. Uh, and ask questions there because that lets the whole community see the question and the answer and we all learn together. And thanks so much for joining us tonight, guys. Uh, everybody keep safe. Uh, stay at home, keep the hands clean, and uh, thanks for joining us.